Coach Aaron Fletcher, how you doing, man? Doing great. Doing great. How you guys doing? Doing all right, man. Super excited about having you on. Thanks so much for for taking the time right here in the middle of the season. I know you guys got about uh four four big ones left and uh or at least scheduled for for that matter, man. So thanks for taking about thirty minutes to sit down with us. But before we get going, coach, I just wanted to ask the question that we that we've been asking a lot of our coaches here recently is uh, what was that moment in your life that you knew you wanted to be a football coach? And what was it about this great profession that we're in that that attracted you to it? Uh, I think the moment for me happened um, probably like my senior year of high school. Um, a guy, a man that I deeply admired was my high school, one of my high school football coaches who also was my high school track coach. Uh, Ray Jackson Sr. Uh, that was there at Austin LBJ High School. Um, and to me, it wasn't more of the uh, the athletic part of it. I think it was how he related and how he was able to mentor, you know, young women, women and men uh, throughout the building and throughout the city. Uh, that was the thing that actually kind of sparked that interest because I said I wanted to be happy like him, <laughs> you know. So that was the thing that kind of sparked my interest in regards to coaching. Coach, you, you've kind of you've always been able to have a really solid secondary, uh, especially there at Tulsa over the last uh, couple of years, and and so we wanted to ask you just kind of about the consistency and and uh, how do you kind of go about keeping that consistency with performance out of your athletes, especially with a position group that's as dynamic uh, and interchangeable as defensive backs. Yeah, yeah, that's uh that's been a it's been a blessing to have. You know, those guys have been playing at a really high level over you know last several years, three years, you know, um, I think it had a lot to do with those young men buying into the culture that we wanted to uh, have. You know, one of my mentors, a uh, uh, guy I've named Dwayne Aquina, I got a chance to see how he was when he was at the University of Texas and uh, how his guys were interchangeable at that time and, you know, his reasoning behind it. So I, in a sense, modeled uh, my group, my room after that. And, um, uh, you know, just just having the standard of expectation uh, that those guys wanted, you know, um, to not only be able to go compete, but how they prepare, you know, making sure they prepared at a championship level and and taking those battles personally. So that's been good and held up. Is there is there anything specific? You talked about kind of that uh, that mindset there, uh, you know, the being able to prepare at a championship level and is there anything like do you have like a mantra or anything like that that you that you guys kind of live live life by in that in that position room we we have a in our room at the end of every meeting we have we say win every play one play at a time okay and mean by that it's uh it's it's something we want to be able to do something better the following play that we didn't do the, the the previous play so um we start out with that in meetings, you know, how do we prepare? You know, um, it's, if it's a, if it's a early down type of day, um, when we go in with a blank slate, making sure that we can recall and, and retain uh, what we learned the previous day and being able to make those adjustments faster and faster and faster. And then also being able to dictate what the office does as well. So we always make sure that we, we, we live by that mantra when every play one play at a time, going all out mentally staying locked in, and then just being – just physically imposing our will. Coach, I've always admired what you did on the football field with your players. Obviously, uh, had you come speak last year at the, at the, at the yeah. AFCA convention. So, um, you know, I've always applauded – you know, what you've been able to do on the football field. But I, I, I want to transition because I think what connected us was a little bit more important than, than football, as interesting as that may sound. Um, you know, this – I don't know exactly when, but at some point in time here over the recent years, you were ex exposed to a piece of history that a lot of people don't, you know, have the luxury to find out in, 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 the, in the history books whenever we're sitting down in uh, middle school and high school uh, and, and you were able to – to, to learn about this and, and it kind of hit close to home to where you are right now. And, uh, you know, it, it was an important moment in Tulsa history, but like I said, it's not shared widely in the, in the yearbooks uh, or in the history books. Could you kind of explain what exactly that you learned when you learned it and uh, what resonated with you from this, uh, from this piece of history? Uh, yeah. So uh, with the, uh, the legacy of black wall street, that initiative, that game, that weekly initiative, um, it had, it started out ironically, just getting out in the community a little bit, you know, from going to restaurants, barbershops, 
um, getting a chance to know uh, where I was, you know, from an intimate standpoint. You know, anywhere you go, you want to dive into the community and, and give back. That's, I think that's part of our purpose. Um, but I got a chance to, to learn from those uh, descendants of those that, that survived the, the race massacre uh, and, and families about what happened and it blew my mind. Um, so that took me somewhere else. It took me somewhere else to, to find out the why. And uh, I didn't see a lot of um, intimate connection with the North Tulsa, the Greenwood um, black community here in Tulsa, Oklahoma and uh, our university. You know, um, not not in the sense of that it was like a closed door type of deal, but I didn't see uh, where they felt welcomed, that there was a real intimate relationship between the two. Um, so it's been over a year and a half that that's been on my heart and mind. Uh, I've had a chance to go talk to some youth football teams and have my players go do the same uh, because those guys, in a sense, uh, I was taught, and I'm, and I'm amongst that mindset, if you see more, that you'll do more. And uh, just wanted to make sure we brought some different exposure and some awareness to what was going on. And uh, also that we, number one, grew uh, our student athletes here, you know, from a, from, a, from a curriculum standpoint, them understanding where they are and what happened and what transpired. Uh, I always use that, that, that phrase, you can't put a Band-Aid on a broken bone. And uh, I wanted those guys to be able to be a part of the healing process you know, uh, of our community and the university. If you wouldn't mind, Coach, could you like just as quickly as possible kind of give a brief explanation of what what transpired in those uh, in, in the Black Wall Street situation? Yeah, so what happened um, in 1921, there was a situation in which uh, a young black man was actually on the elevator with a, with a white woman. And, you know, to my understanding, there was a, you know, something that happened, you know, as elevators back during that time, you know, elevators even shake during this time now. Yeah. And um, what happened is, you know, the guy came off after the elevator shaking, you know, guy came off running out because he was in there with a white woman. And, um, you know, people saw it, you know, it gave the perception of something happening that, you know, there was some inappropriate or foul behavior that happened inside of the elevator or whatever have you. Um, you know, people say that wasn't the case. And it started um, one of the largest acts of terrorism, uh, the largest act of terrorism in our, on, on American soil to this day, um, outside of 9-11, you know, in which, you know, an entire, you know, 36 square blocks, people were, were massacred, were killed. Um, businesses bombed, um, churches bombed, um, and I mean bombed, not just, you know, cocktail bombs on feet. I'm talking about people being on, in planes, uh, bombing an entire part of town, um, you know, which, you know, which was very affluent, one of the most, the most affluent uh, black part of the country. So that's what happened uh, in regards to the 1921 race massacre at Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yeah, this uh, obviously Coach Price mentioned, you know, this hasn't been very well depicted uh, in history uh, up until this point, but it actually has has shown up a little bit more in pop culture in the, the last recent or recent couple of years. I've noticed it being referenced to in, in a couple of different television shows and uh, actually being depicted, which is which is hard to watch, uh, even just in a, a television show. Um, but you did mention the legacy of Black Wall Street and the the game that you guys do here in Tulsa. And so I kind of want to transition to that um, and, and have you explain what that is uh, and kind of how, as you learned about this, what led you to want to do uh, this this game where, where uh, you know, I'll let you explain it. What What is the legacy of Black Wall Street game uh, and, and how did you kind of come about that? Okay. The, the uh, legacy of Black Wall Street, the game, is an initiative that was created. Uh, it was in the thought process, like I said, a little over a year and a half ago. Um, and this initiative that's created to uh, grow and grow community in school, number one. Um, in growing community in school, there's a piece of awareness that you have to bring about. Um, and we're at a time and place right now where it's um, more acceptable to say, to have the conversations. 
So not only did you want to have those conversations, but, you know, in light of that, you wanted to make sure that you had some sort of solution to the conversation that you had. You don't just want to talk to be talking, you know. So uh, what what we decided to do was uh, have a week's worth of initiatives um, that, you know, stood from community service, uh, civic engagement, um, some educational pieces and forms, um, also making sure that we brought uh, and honored not only those legacies uh, that were that were destroyed, uh, those businesses that were destroyed, but we wanted to honor those legacies of those black businesses, those educators, because those guys were very uh, innovative and creative in regards to not only the state of Oklahoma, but our country as a whole. You know, those our country as a whole, there were there were veterans from the military there as well. So we wanted to honor them because as you can see, like some of those bodies weren't even they they're just now starting to dig and, and, and they're making these assumptions that there are a lot of them uh being exhumed right now. Uh, so we wanted to honor them. We wanted to also honor those those prominent alums that are that have also uh, helped to grow our university. Um there's a there's a lady by the name of Dr. Cecilia Palmer who was the first black faculty member at the University of Tulsa and Oklahoma State University. So being able to honor her, um, uh, there are five six guys that broke the color barrier here at the University of Tulsa in regards to sports. I've actually talked to three of them and the widow of one of the others, um, making sure that we talk about them. I got a chance to hear their stories. Um, Drew Pearson, Lovey Smith. There's so many guys that have helped to carve their niche in this university and the community that we don't speak of, you know what I mean? So I wanted to make sure that we we, we combine that, we honor them, uh, and we didn't deviate from who it is and what they were. You know, it's uh, it's it's showing and bringing awareness to how important uh, the black people in Tulsa uh, were in regards to their business savvy, their, uh, their, their acumen in regards to education as well, and those that actually attended the university and combine that to inspire and grow our young students here now and those young people that are in the North Tulsa and Greenwood community uh, currently. Coach, you mentioned that some of your players have um, taken the initiative to get out and, and, and speak about this to the youth teams in the community. You, you've you been very active. Could you just quickly talk about uh, the, the support that you've uh, had from your coaching staff as well as your players that's helped move this initiative to where it is now? Yeah, we actually, and it's been really great to have the support of our, of, of our, number one, our, our administration. Uh, Dr. Derek Gregg, who was actually a part of the university, went on to be, uh, to, as a senior VP with the NCAA and his diversity, um, uh, department as well. Um, he was really supportive. Uh, Rick Dixon, who is our interim athletic director right now, and Coach Philip Montgomery, um, they've been really supportive. So we've had that support in regards to administration. And then our student athletes, uh, they've been very active. Uh, there's a brother, Chris Paul, that we have on our team who's a, a part of the uh, American Athletic Conference's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, um, Caleb Evans, uh, Devin Lamp. We have a lot of people that have actually gotten out uh, and have partnered, you know, and wanted to make sure. I, a lot of teams on campus, actually, too, uh, to go visit the Greenwood area making sure that we're doing some shadowing and mentoring programs as well. So they've been really good about getting out, bringing awareness to what's happened. And um, talking about the desire to have curriculum here geared towards that to help grow our community and school relationship. I want to make sure that our listeners understand kind of how big this thing has gotten uh, in terms of the attention. And and you've gotten a lot of national media attention, especially, you know, this year leading into the game uh, from channels like ESPN, CNN, Tulsa World, many more. Um, Explain to us the feeling that you've kind of started this thing from scratch and now, you know, you've gotten to a point where you're getting articles in ESPN written about you, you know, you're getting interviewed, by, you know, on CNN and stuff like that. Like what, explain like the feeling that, it, you know, that to bring it to this point. Yeah. Um, just hearing you say that right now is, is, is giving me. I just feel like I did God's will. I feel like I did God's will. Um, I'm a man of faith. And, you know, one of the things that I believe that, that, that Christ had us to do was be a voice for the voiceless. And there are so many people 
that actually stood where I'm currently standing today that didn't get a chance. That they believed in better, but they didn't get a chance to um they didn't get a chance to to see what it is that I'm actually living in right now. They didn't get a chance to express um what was going on uh for fear of lives, professionalism, uh all of those things. Um so to have a Skip Bayless, to have a CNN, to have ESPN, to have Tulsa World, to have these different people um, reach out, retweet, uh, AFCA, you know, words can't express. I know that I was doing God's will and I am doing God's will when this project started. And it just, um, <laughs> there's a scripture that says obedience is better than sacrifice. So I am, I'm at a loss for words at times. Um, because it's being in it, you didn't get a chance to get a, you know, to really know what was going on. Right. But um, I'm blessed because I see how it's been blessing so many other people, the city, the state, and the country as well. Yeah, I think, too, like, as you gain more attention, obviously part of the initiative is to to educate, right? And so you, you want, like you mentioned, you know, to, to introduce this p- piece of history into curriculum, you know, there in Tulsa, around Oklahoma, and ultimately, hopefully, around the country, right? Because it's an important part of our, our history. And I think as you gain more and more attention, uh, it's harder for people uh, in powerful places to to you know, keep you quiet to keep the to keep this uh, piece of history quiet because there's so many. As more and more people talk about it, it becomes harder to to suppress that. And I think that's a great uh, byproduct of this whole this whole national media attention, which obviously it's not what you set out to do. But ultimately, I think it's going to help you achieve some of the goals that you set out to achieve. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, um, <laughs> it's crazy enough. You know, I was told, hey, you know. Be careful, you know, yeah. don't, you know, kind of tread lightly sort of <laughs> deal. Um, but that's not who God called me to be, you know. So um, even if I were to tread lightly, you know, the word was out, you know. So, uh, you know, it was, and it touched some people. You know, I actually got a call from Skip Bayless, and he was just, very congratulatory and was like, I know all too well. I remember him saying, I know all too well, you know, being a, being a native Oklahoman, um, you know, what happened in 1921. Um, John Wooten, you know, who was, you know, very instrumental, you know, one of the founders of the first pilot alliance, uh, you know, it was also there at the Cleveland some, you know, helping to defend Muhammad Ali, uh, during his time reached out. Um, it's it's kind of taken into a like you said a life and a voice of its own uh, because now you know people want to know what happened mm-hmm. and now they want to be a part of the solution. How do we grow from here? Um, so regardless if I didn't say another word, it was out there, mm-hmm. you know. And, and, uh, and now the healing is going to take place, and I'm all for it. That's right, Coach. Well, I, I think for any of our listeners or anybody that's actually watching this as well, I think it's hard to miss the passion. Uh, you're extremely passionate about this, and uh, mm-hmm. We, we appreciate that. And so I'm going to end with this. What exactly does this statement mean? More than a coach. More than a coach. More than a coach. And as simple a statement as that is, it's powerful in itself. Um, when I say that I'm more than a coach, um, there are so many hats that we all wear as coaches. Uh, I started out as a, as a middle school coach. And I've been blessed to to become a Division One football coach now. So when I say more than a coach, I've had to play the role of father. I've had to play the role of a brother. I've had to play the role of counselor. I've had to play the play the role of a uh, of advocate, activist. Um, so I'm not relegated to just coaching ball. I'm not that guy. You know, I think we have a, a spiritual ob- obligation as well to uh, be able to pour into young people, men and women alike, to enhance them, uh, their awareness, and grow their confidence in advocacy as well, because that's what we do as coaches. That's what we do. We grow the confidence of those young people that we're around on a regular to become better, to become more than, whatever more than is. 
whatever more than is, more than a, more than a, more than a, a professor, more than a teacher, more than a doctor, more than a lawyer. I just so happen to be in the coaching profession. So I'm more than that. So that's what that means. That's who we are. That's what we do. And that's our calling. It's never a job. It's a call. Coach, we, like Coach Price said, anybody watching this, listening to this, they can, they can see, they can hear the passion. And we appreciate you uh, putting that out there. And I think we need more coaches in the profession like that. And we appreciate you taking the time to, to talk with us today. Before we let you go, though, I want to give you not one opportunity here to, to share social media handles, uh, places that guys can, can follow your journey, uh, follow, uh, you know, about the legacy of Black Wall Street, uh, get involved if they want to. What's, what's the best way for guys to do that? Absolutely. Um, my, you can follow me. You can always reach me on my social media. I'm very active on my Twitter platform. It's at the coach Fletch, the coach F L E T C H. And then my Instagram is just coach Fletch as well. So guys will be able to, uh, to reach me on there, follow me on that. And I continue to educate and bring awareness. Uh, and I love interacting as well, uh, to, to help grow other people as well, you know, inspire. So my life's purpose yeah we'll we'll link all that stuff down in the show notes to make it easy for for everyone to uh to get there but like we said coach thanks so much for for taking the time thanks for what you do coach. thank you thank you guys so much for having me and i hope it's been a blessing thank you so absolutely. much absolutely